Hi. Well, we come to the center of the messages to the seven churches in the Roman province of Asia. And we do that, as you can see on the right side of the screen, in the town of Thyatira, which curiously and perhaps surprisingly, but ultimately it shouldn't be surprising, is the least important of the seven cities from a Roman perspective. And I say not surprisingly uh, that this will be the center because from Jesus' perspective, the least important is the most important. And uh, it's not that the city's without problems, but this is the one we put at the center there, uh, at the center of the seven-part chiasm. And many people have arranged this longest of the seven messages into its chiastic form itself. We're not going to do that right here, but we'll see that at the center of this passage is something that's at the center of all the messages to all the ecclesiae. So let's first, as we've been doing, find out something about this place. So uh, Thyatira, again, not important uh, from the Roman perspective. It's uh, inland. It's not a port like some of the other cities. Let's take a quick look over at Google Maps so we can see um, what this city was like. So, so we'll use our Google Maps tool and we can see here it's currently uh, listed as the current town of Akisar, but if we zoom in on here, you can see that it highlights that that, that was the historical Thyatira. And as you can see, here's Patmos uh, down, uh, down below here in the Aegean Sea, and you can see the distance here from Patmos uh, way up here, away from the water, and not in a particularly important place. And if we zoom in on it, um, although we saw in Pergamum the remnants of famous temples and other uh, signs of Rome's presence, including the Great Altar. But here in the town of Akisar, there's really nothing that notes the, uh, the reality of the historical city. So it's not as important a city. Um, although it has an ancient foundation, it was reconstructed by the Seleucid Greeks in, after the time of Alexander the Great uh, as a frontier garrison. And then a century later, it became subject to the control of Pergamum. So in many ways, it was um, a, a, what was called a daughter city, a city that was subject to the jurisdiction of a larger city, in this case, Pergamum. It was populated by traders and artisans, and you can see the long list of trades that uh, there's evidence for there. That was really important because traders and artisans met in guilds, and those guilds were very suspicious to the Romans because um, they were associations that the Romans couldn't control. And they were also suspicious, uh, as we'll see from John's perspective, John of Patmos's perspective, uh, because all of those included some kind of blessing or ritual to a, a pagan deity, uh, to whatever the patronal uh, goddess or god was to that, that particular trade. Um, so that'll become the question of food that we'll see um, as an issue here in this ecclesia. It's also the regional center of the Asian slave trade network, and we'll see that the term for service um, is used a number of times here, or servants. Uh, the patron god was a form of uh, Apollo, uh, Apollo Tyrannus, and uh, the only reference to it outside of this in the New Testament is in Acts 16.14, uh, only indirectly is the hometown of Lydia, but Paul meets her just outside of Philippi, so we really don't know much uh, about her place in that. So let's begin to, to look at the message at Thyatira. It starts as they all do, and I'll put up the structure so we can remind of that, with a title for Jesus, in this case, a double title, the one whose eyes are like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Uh, some folks have taken this eyes like a flame of fire as, uh, as about a powerful eye uh, over against some kind of witchcraft power as expressed uh, in Jezebel. Um, as you can see in my note, um, that's one of Duff's uh, thoughts here. Um, could be. Um, and the feet are like burnished bronze is also, of course, echoing something we saw in the beginning here and also from Daniel. So it starts off right away with, I know your works. And um, as uh, Pamela Thymus says, that uh, initial praise will be quickly forgotten in the condemnation of Jezebel. We'll see in the next verse. So I know your works. And the word for works, erga here, is five times in this message. So it's clearly about uh, what people are doing. And important to look at the four of these, because this is what's being praised as four ways of being that are the are central. And ironically, these words, a couple of these words are hardly ever used in Revelation. So in this case, agape, which is only in 2-4 elsewhere, um, not a lot of love expressed in uh, this text. Uh, your faith, pistes and piston, um, it could also be translated trust or loyalty because in the patronage system of Rome, um, piston was used to express one's relationship with a patron. So although Christian readers now think of faith as one's relationship with God, at its root, it's a question of confidence or trust or loyalty to some kind of relationship, not the later platonically influenced intellectual notion of agreeing to a set of doctrines or principles. 
Um, so the, they're holding firm in their relationship with Jesus, with their service. Um, diaconia here is only here in Revelation. It's a common word otherwise for what Christians should be doing, Jesus followers should be doing, but it's only here. Um, and Auni notes that the cognates of diaconia were used for a spectrum of roles, the menial to the privilege, highlighting the connection with the slave network. Uh, that's headquartered in Thyatira. And then hupomene, which is a common word as we've seen. We saw it in the very beginning in the prologue, and we've seen it several times in the messages, and we'll only see it two times outside the, uh, the messages here. So four things that are, are being praised here. Practicing love, holding on to faith or trust, um, serving others, and hanging firm in the face of empire. Uh, and then he continues, I know that your last works here, the word eschata, I used a number of times, uh, from which theologians derive the word eschatological to refer to the things of the end, like heaven, hell, judgment, and resurrection. Um, but here it's probably not referring to that, but simply um, the, their most recent works, their final works. Uh, the reverse of the message of the Ephesians, um, which was the exact opposite as, as we saw then. So now it changes. And when it changes, we have to uh, involve a number of complicated questions here. Um, so as Friedrich notes here, the attitude taken here is opposed to that adopted with regard to the Ephesians, who hate the Nicolaitans and unmask the false prophets. Um, but here, it's about tolerating Jezebel. And we can note that in the last video, when we were looking at Pergamum, and I'll slide it back up there so we can see, um, the opponents in Pergamum were uh, referred to not only as the Nicolaitans, um, but people who hold to the teaching of Balaam, and that's a reference back to the Hebrew scripture, although as we noted in the last video, um, what's being named here is clearly not specifically connected with the Balaam of Hebrew Bible, but with later traditions. Here, similarly, Jezebel, um, who is also a biblical figure and uh, has a teaching, and those are the only times that teaching is used, um, the didascale words, in Revelation. So uh, John is using those negatively here as teachings that are opposing uh, the message of the risen Jesus. And uh, so you tolerate that woman Jezebel. And of course, what this brings up is the question of, of Jezebel, both as a historical figure and what why this name is being used, and also connected with quote unquote female behaviors, stereotypical female, beha female behaviors like beguiling or leading men into adultery. And this has led many women scholars to see this not as the message of Jesus, but the message of John as an argument with women leaders. And so we have to take a pause back. I want to put up on the screen a, a briefly a history of feminist biblical interpretation of the book of Revelation. And in the uh, older generation, we have Adela Yarbrough Collins, who um, uh, wrote two books on Revelation, and also Elizabeth Schuessler Fiorenza, who is uh, probably the leading feminist biblical uh, scholar alive. Um, and has written dozens of books. Um, and both of them see this positively in the sense of what's at issue is not criticizing women, but criticizing idolatry, and Jezebel as a stereotypical um, form for that, referring to the wife of King Ahab of the northern kingdom of Israel, challenged by the prophet Elijah um, f for idolatry, for being a foreign woman. Um, but Jezebel there was a queen, and this person's clearly not a queen, and so um, what exactly is at issue? So more recent scholars, um, and you can see here a couple of examples, uh, Catherine Keller and uh, Tina Pippin, and more recently uh, Pamela Thymus in an article that summarizes the history of this scholarship, um, sees this as man versus woman and one Christian leader against another Christian leader. Um, whereas Craig Kester, the author of the Anchor uh, Bible Commentary in Revelation, um, challenges that and sees it not as a matter of gender, but as a matter of the practice that's at issue, and it just happens to be gender. I'm not going to purport to resolve that. Um, women who see this as derogatory toward women certainly have the right to say that and have a certain point to be made. Um, one of the questions that any reader has to pay attention to is this uh, a revelation of Jesus as it claims to be and it's being transcribed or at least put into words uh, by John or is John using that as a propaganda device to control people he doesn't like in this case uh, the argument is women uh, whose ministry he's either jealous of or wants to control as women or at least as people who are not him um, you can decide that for yourself um, there's no way to make uh, give us an answer to that um, but what we see described is the woman um, who he calls Jezebel, who certainly didn't have that actual name any more than the other person was a teacher of Balaam, um, calls herself a prophet, 
Um, prophet is not uh, used very often here in Revelation, other than in John's role. Uh, other prophets are not mentioned. And is teaching and beguiling my servants. And a rare reference to servants belonging to Jesus here. Uh, the word for beguiling is usually the word I uh, use for leading people uh, away from God. Um, it's a sort of deception that leads people away. So it's not necessarily a gender word, even though uh, the note from Themis there suggests it is. Um, it's often used in other places as a verb simply for uh, misleading people um, into worshiping somebody other than God. Um, in this case, to, as the New Revised Standard has, to practice fornication and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So one of the issues is, are these two things or one thing? Um, as my note on fornication, porneia, which we saw exactly the same thing in the previous uh, message to the church in Pergamum, um, is literally means sexual immorality, which means the kind of sexuality that any particular culture prohibits. But it's also plainly a metaphor um, for imperial intercourse, as we're going to see. So as, um, as uh, a couple scholars have noted here, um, the fornication is often spiritualized, but the eating food sacrificed to idols is taken as literally eating food. So why would you spiritualize one and not the other? But as may noted, and uh, has here, perhaps it's what scholars call ep exegetical, which is to say the and isn't connecting two things, porneia, fornication, and eating food sacrificed to idols, but something operating like in English, as you see in my note, i.e. operates, that is to say, practicing porneia, that is eating food sacrificed to idols. And there's good reason for thinking that's the issue because there are a number of other things that connect this to sacrificing uh, food, eating food sacrificed to idols, as we'll see. Um, for John, that would be an issue because uh, every time they meet in the trade guilds, they'd be eating food sacrificed to their gods. Um, it's a similar issue as we saw last time that Paul brings up in 1 Corinthians. Uh, some of the feminist scholars read a difference here between uh, Paul as tolerant and um, pushing the, the issue away from food, and whereas John makes food a dividing line. But uh, I would ask those scholars, is food the dividing line or is participation and identity with empire the dividing line? In other words, is it really about food or is it about the symbol of food that suggests uh, that you're accepting the, the Roman world that the food is a part of in terms of uh, sacrificing it to uh, other gods? Um, uh, and we'll see there's a lot about idolatry that's at issue here, especially at the end of the uh, first scroll where, um, where John laments that people have not um, in, uh, not repented from their uh, worship of uh, gold and silver and idols of uh, other materials as well. So we'll see that at the end of the uh, first scroll, at the end of chapter 9. So it continues, I gave her time, in this case chrono, so literally a unit of time as opposed to kairos, a special moment in time, to repent, a commonly used verb, but she refuses to repent of her fornication, literally does not want to repent, and that will again anticipate one of the many connections I might as well show it to you here in 920 and 21. Uh, where they did not repent of the works of their hands and of idols, etc. And while we're here, let's note that their murder, sorcery, fornication, and theft, as what I like to call the four cardinal sins of empire, are parallel negatively to the four works that are being praised up here, love, faith, service, and hupomene, patient endurance. Um, so, given the failure of repentance, we hear another of uh, verse that is challenging to us in many ways, both in terms of gender and otherwise. Um, so we see, the first there's a question of who's being addressed here. There's Jezebel, there's those who are described as commit adultery with her, and there's the, what we see down here in verse 24, the loipos, or the rest. So there's um, three different groups here, and there may well be others in the community who are not engaging this idolatry, but are sympathetic uh, to those who are in some way. So there's a real question of that, and Duff um, uh, notes that there's potentially three groups there. The phrase for throwing her on a bed um, is sounds violent, and it is violent, but it's also a figure of speech that can mean a number of things. And so, literally, the idiom to throw someone on a bed, as you can see from my notice, to cause someone to become ill, um, as you can see from the low Nita um, uh, lexicon there. There's also, as Craig Kester from the Anchor Bible suggests, four overlapping meanings of the phrase thrower on the bed. So one is porneia in the sense of it's a sexual image. Another is eating a meal at a cline, which is what the word for bed is here. So we would have a different word for couch and bed, but cline is the same word here. So it's where people would tend to eat 
uh, on a clean A, uh, especially in a, in a group gathering, you'd have um, a three uh, clean A together in like a three-sided square with an open end that would look out to the street so that people could see each other and so the, the food servers and the drink servers could get inside that space. Um, so that's a possibility. It's also a possibility that it means being sick um, as the more obvious image and what the phrase suggests, or it could be dying. Um, so G the risen Jesus through John here saying that this is what's going to happen to this woman Jezebel in the community. And those who commit adultery with her, um, which is only here in Revelation, but we'll come back to these connections from Hebrew Scripture in a moment, um, with her throwing into great distress. Um, uh, the word flips in here is the word we saw that John shares with his uh, listeners here way back in chapter one, the pressure. Um, so distress or great pressure. Um, going back to the word for idolatry here, uh, moikoantos, um, note a couple of background pieces. So from Jeremiah 3, 8, and 9, we have this. Um, she saw that for all the adulteries of that faithful one Israel, I had sent her away with a decree of divorce, yet her false sister Judah did not fear, but she too went and played the whore. This is referring to Israel and Judah as two sisters who are whores. Um, and so you see here the use of idolatry um, and whoredom connected with I idolatry. Adultery and idolatry. Um, and the same thing here in Ezekiel 23. Um, for they have committed adultery and blood is on their hands with their idols. They have committed adultery. Um, so uh, that connection between uh, adultery as a uh, euphemism for um, intercourse with idols uh, in the sense of it's not just porneia, it's not just illicit intercourse, but it's being unfaithful uh, to their relationship with God. Um, so that's certainly what Ezekiel and Jeremiah have in mind in the standard metaphor of, of God, Yahweh, as the husband and Israel as the wife in the covenant relationship. And so then it gets even darker. I will strike her children dead. Um, the phrase here is ambiguous though. Uh, Apokteno and thanato can mean strike with a plague uh, where like in 6.8 it's translated as, um, as a plague and actually in this case as pestilence but it's the same word there. Um, so um, it could mean would uh, kill her with a plague or strike her dead as we see here but either way it's a tough image. And Kester notes there's uh, certainly a lack of love in these threats here. Um, we can only work that out by reading the rest of the book, as we'll continue to do. And then we get to the sentence that's at the very center. So this is at the center of this message and the center of the entire set of seven messages. And notice it's addressed to all the churches. And all the churches will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts, and I give to each of you as your works deserve. Um, the phrase for searching minds and hearts is an important one here. You see uh, the Greek literally means kidneys and hearts, and it's echoing on this image from Jeremiah 17 that we see here. I, Yahweh, test the same phrase there, mind and, and search the heart to give all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. So note for Jeremiah, as for um, the risen Jesus through John here, this is not about going to heaven or going to hell when you die, but as it is in many parts of the Hebrew scripture, like Leviticus 25 and 26, or Deuteronomy, many others, where it's being described if you live a certain way, there's good consequences, and if you live contrary to God's way, there are bad consequences. And this is certainly fitting with uh, that larger theme. Um, so having praised the works of some and having criticized um, Jezebel and her followers, now there's a, a remnant, uh, a loipos here, and that's really important because um, the remnant theology was one that apocalyptic literature was about long before the time of Jesus, the sense that a small group of Israelites would be all that God would have um, to preserve in the face of the adultery and idolatry of the leaders and others, and like texts like Ezekiel 34 where all the leaders have gone astray, and it's up to the people to try to figure it out for themselves. Uh, and many of the intertestamental texts like First Enoch and Fourth Ezra um, speak of a remnant in one way or another. So in this case, a loipos, um, a subset of the Ecclesia and Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned, and an interesting phrase here, what some call the deep things of Satan. Let's look at that a little more closely. Um, Bathea here, the word for deep, as Pollard notes, a substantive that designates matters that are hidden and beyond human scrutiny. Um, so it's more like, like mystery, um, something we can't get at with our minds or our sensory experiences. And then the phrase, things of Satan, which is only here, um, could be a sarcastic inversion of the deep things or depths of God, as Paul uses the language, um, or it could be referring to Roman power. Uh, it could be referring to the folks um, who have not uh, learned, so to speak, 
um, the ways of cooperating with Rome um, in a deep way. Um, and so he says, I do not lay any other burdens on you, only hold fast, the same phrase that we heard at the beginning of chapter 2, to what you have until I come. Um, and then the conclusion we hear here in these final verses. And these final verses, um, let's read them and then we'll look at the combinations of text behind them. To everyone who conquers continues to do my work to the end, I will give authority over the nations to rule them with an iron rod as when clay pots are shattered. Uh, and as a number of people po have pointed out here, there's a set of five Hebrew scriptures that were understood as messianic, um, and they form here in Revelation a set of pairs. So you can see the, the texts up here, and you can see um, the way they're paired differently in different places. So here's obviously the one we're on right now, combining these first two, and you see that there with the iron rod and the morning star. Um, as many people have, have noted, uh, let me go back before I get to that. So, uh, could you do my works to the end, in this case, telos, not eschaton, so not the last, but to the completion. I will give authority over the nations. And a number of scholars have noted that the church of least Roman significance is getting the highest level of authority. And not only is it the highest level of authority, it's an authority that otherwise um, belonged to Jesus. Um, so, Jesus will have authority over the nations um, uh, and to rule them with an iron rod. Um, so um, these people who are given this authority from the lowest place, just as Jesus the Lamb is. The phrase iron rod, um, which is from Psalm 2.9, can sound like it's violent, but it doesn't suggest anybody's hitting them, even though the image of clay pot shattered sounds like that. Uh, as Given notes here, this does not imply cruel, heartless domination, but expresses in standard biblical imagery unquestioned authority over the world, basically that of a shepherd protecting his flock. So it's more like a shepherd's crook that we're picturing here, which would be iron, uh, and that certainly could be used to keep a sheep, a sheep in place, but it's not suggesting that he's beating on them. Um, so to rule them with an iron rod, even as I have received authority fr from my father. Notice the framing of authority here in verse 26 and verse 28. So the authority that Jesus has, he's passing on to those in Thyatira who have remained faithful and have, have not had intercourse with empire. Um, and, and it concludes here with anyone who conquers, I will give the morning star that uh, messianic imagery from uh, Numbers 24. Um, so twice we're hearing about uh, the star. We'll hear it uh, more as we go, too, because as we can see in the chart on the right, these things combine in different ways, like at the very end when Isaiah 11 is combined with uh, Numbers 24, 17. So that was a little bit of a longer one to get through Thyatira, and we'll pick up next time with Sardis as we uh, wind our way through into the fifth of the seven uh, messages to the Ecclesia in Roman Asia. See you next time. Bye-bye.